Good morning. Shall we get uh, started on time? And it's 8:02 back home. <laughs> okay, so I was I was given free will as to what I could talk about today. They didn't even put a title in the um, program. I, I don't think. Is there a description in there? Yeah, there's something in there about revolution. Oh, nice. I was wondering if they were gonna dare put that on. Yeah, I, I was asked for a title, but fundamentally, there is something that uh, I go around hundreds of conferences. I probably have done 400 presentations in the last five years. Um, some, year, some months I do four, five, six in a single month. In a single month. Uh, I just came from Belize. I did five presentations there. I did three here. So in this uh, four days, it's been eight presentations Coding right now. So, <clears throat> and in all of those places, the one fascinating thing is that I get to meet people who want to change things. And when we start talking about how they want to change things, most of their pathways and their brain patterns are associated with the way we created the problems. That is fundamentally why we're not changing much. I was going to say another word. Um, and the reason is because fundamentally we don't understand. We are not even aware of how colonized we have become. So colonized that we don't, we don't think differently. Like if you come in here, you come into the door, you sit down in one of those chairs, it doesn't even cross your mind to think, why are these chairs set up the way they are? Why am I standing here and you there? See that power relationship, that power dynamic. Um, now, if I was, uh, if I were a, uh, you know, big white guy with two PhDs and you know a million dollars of a company that I just uh, sold out or whatever, you would see me completely different. Why is that? Because we are fully colonized to see the world through those lenses, and that is why we don't change. Because it doesn't matter if we are doing community garden in the city or we are doing farming in the countryside, we tend to think of agriculture still as something that goes from, I want to produce cabbage or tomatoes or lettuce or whatever, and I need the seed, I need the soil, I need inputs, and then I will harvest what I, what I want. That's the way we think of, of food. And there's nothing in nature that is actually designed to be that way. So fundamentally, if you think of food, and I will repeat this for those who weren't here before, is basically simply energy in different states of transformation. The laws of thermodynamics establishes that the two fundamental ways energy behaves is one, by conserving it, the law, the law of conservation. That's the first law of thermodynamics. So you can't create it. You can't trans uh, you know, destroy it. You can only transform it. So, you know, the glass of water left in there is going to be empty in a few days if you let it there because of the second law, which is entropy. But the energy in that glass is, is it's just going to go somewhere else. It conserves itself. So those are the two fundamental laws that govern everything, everything, including the way that supposedly the universe is expanding at a large, massive scale. It's still based on the same law, right? So if we understand that, then we also would understand that all we are here is a lot of energy and a very sophisticated way of being organized. We're just sophisticated, organized molecules and energy. That's where we are. And if, when you die, you will go into the, into the entropic stage, which means you're going to dissolve and you're going to become air again and soil and nutrients and all of that. And then that energy will be reorganized in another form. Maybe you. You, part of you will be in a lizard, another one in a tree, and another one in a bird, and then some microbes are going to take some of your energy, and it's going to keep going. Now, if you believe in soul and the spirits and all of that, which I do wholeheartedly, that is the foundation of that you know, spirituality. That's why we need to be connected to that world, because we are that world. In fact, the energy that you are borrowing right now to be able to be alive came from trees, came from the soil, came through carrots and all the stuff that you ate this morning, or the eggs you ate, that energy, think of where it came from. 
That energy is now going to become blood cells, it's going to become muscles, it's going to become ATP, ADN, RAN, all of those things that you need came from that egg, which previously was in a chicken, which previously was in the form of feed, which previously was in the form of grain, which previously was in the form of CO2 in the atmosphere, and NH4, NH4 uh, in the ammonia, and in the soil, and everywhere. And so, who are we? Simply energy in different states of transformation. And we forget about all of that because we allow ourselves to be so colonized that somewhere many Many thousands of years ago, we got this idea that we can control the way energy flows. We can manipulate it, but we can't control. And the way we manipulate it is in the form of mostly through corporate structures. We have created this mentality that allows us, that has conditioned us to look at this magnificent system and creation, to look at it in a linear form where we need the seed, we need the soil, we put it in there, we put water and nutrients, and out comes carrot, and that's all we see. And so if that's all we see, we accept that a corporation can do that for us or should do that for us. And then we end up where we are today in a corporate totalitarian system that owns and controls almost everything you eat and you use every day, right? So that is why I was calling this a subversive. We need a revolutionary, a revolution to actually change what we're doing because if we don't go back to that fundamental understanding of how things work, we are not going to accomplish much. All we're going to do is flip the way we do something uh, so instead of being conventional with all of kinds of agrochemicals, we're going to go organic, and then still the companies are going to control our food no matter what. I mean, the use of chemicals, no tilling, organic, all of those things, those are not even necessary uh, to be part of a regenerative agriculture conversation because it's not about practices. <laughs> it's about the way we think. That's what defines whether you are a regenerative farmer or not. Not whether you till or not till, organic or organic, that, those are practices. And practices are just by little points in a process that regenerates the soil, the soul, the spirit, and our ability to connect to each other. And that, for that to happen, you have to decolonize the mind. It won't happen otherwise. Because if we don't decolonize it, we're going to go back to that slippery slope where we end up linear. And linear thinking doesn't exist in nature. Nature thinks and operates, but not in linear ways. So that's what I wanted to get to you today. Um, in decolonizing agriculture, I, I, I did write up a blueprint for it. I mostly work with poultry and in, uh, in the design and engineering that I did for poultry systems to actually turn them regenerative from the perspective I just told you about. So we don't consider ourselves poultry producers or farmers or any of that. We are energy <laughs> stewards. We steward energy through those processes that I just described to you. And to the extent that we understand those processes, we have engineered a way to get that chicken to deliver to us the optimum amount of energy that nature wants and allows us to harvest in the form of eggs, in the form of meat, nuts, vegetables, corn, grains, all of the things. And all of it, we so far in 10 years have done it with zero outside manufactured inputs. The system produces more energy than we will ever harvest. In average, we think we are harvesting between 20 and 30% of the total energy that is being transformed in the process. And so as we harvest only 20 to 30%, 70% or 60% or 80%, depending on which crop or which thing you are harvesting, which, which energy form you are harvesting out of the cycles, most of that energy goes back into the system to support the next energy cycle. And because it's always a surplus, there is no end to how much it will gener regenerate. So up to this point in 10 years, we, we are seeing in, in, in the first two years, we saw some of that energy getting plowed back. In some places, we brought more, more stuff because the land was so depleted of energy. And in some places, we left it alone and we just allowed it to regenerate itself. All of them are now uh, uh, coming to the point of optimization uh, 10 years later, where some of our hazelnut trees are producing two and three times what anybody ever expected them to produce. They, they, don't, they have a genetic limit. All of us do. 
how much you will grow has a limit, how strong you'll get has a limit, how many children you can have if you're a woman is, has a limit. Um, all of that, all, all of the reproductive capacity has a limit. And so, but we go around at a very low percentage of our genetic capacity because we are not supported fully in our energy balance. When you are energy imbalanced, you get sick just like a plant. If the plant is energy imbalanced, it's going to get sick from fungi, it's going to get attacked by bugs and all of that. So in order to change all of that, we really have to flip the way we see things. And when we flip that, then we open up that 95 to 98 percent of the possibilities from genetic potential of a plant to our own ability to be healthy, to the amount of labor that we are putting into a place. All of that gets optimized. And then we get to see the 95 percent that you don't see when you operate on a linear basis. And guess what? If you are talking about money, that's exactly where the money is anyway. So why would you do it otherwise, even if that was what drives you? So with that in mind, let's see if we can get to some of these little, little tidbits. And hopefully, um, I was a revolutionary in Guatemala, so uh, I can't talk about revolutions in Guatemala because I'll probably get run out of a room. Um, people are scared of that uh, word because it meant, you know, it meant a lot of bad things to us. Over 600 massacred, one and a half million people in exile almost a million people dead. Uh, so revolution has a different context, but I always think that that is the way we have to think about things. Just don't think of violence. We're not talking about any of that. We're just talking about a revolution of the mind and a revolution of how we see the world. If we can revolutionize how we see the world and flip our, our mind from a colonized perspective of a way of thinking to a not decolonized, and we fight it every day and detox ourselves from that colonization influence, just like we will detox ourselves from the influence of glyphosate and other things, we got to be de you know, continuously detoxifying ourselves of that constant bombardment that colon colonized uh, systems around us are, uh, you know, are coming at us. All the way, like I said, from how we set all of this up to how we see nature. So here's what we're going to go through today in examples. How do we build a nature-based foundation, something that is subversive? If something is not subversive, it's not going to move the ball forward. How to build a process with integrity and commitment? Insurgencies are very difficult to defeat. Even the largest armies in the world have never been able to completely defeat an insurgency because of the way you organize and the level of integrity and commitment that you put on the table when you say, yes, I'll be part of this insurgency. That is why in the peak of the war in Guatemala with less than 10,000 rebels, there was an, a, no, we kept an army of 950,000 on their knees because you can't defeat insurgencies. And so if we think that way, if we flip the way we are thinking about it, oh, we're going to go there and protest, and we get a million march. And then what? Yes, maybe you grab the attention. Maybe you took some space. But how do you hold it? How do you grow it? How do you sustain it? That is more important than disrupting the system. We tend to think of that, and it's supported by the corporate systems and the governments because it changes nothing. They keep going. Elon Musk doesn't have less power. You know, or Cargill and Monsanto and you know, all of those companies that are wrecking our planet and poisoning our food system and us and the water and the air and all of that. They keep going. Nobody has been able to slow them down. And yet, we have created the third largest economy in the world through creating nonprofits. And what, meanwhile, Almost every mission of nonprofits has to do with changing the world by bringing agriculture here and there, and also by dealing with poverty and malnutrition and all of that. We built a large economy, which is you know nonprofits together apparently uh, uh, you know amount to about a, the, a, the fourth largest, largest economy in the world. And at the same time that we grew that, so did poverty and malnutrition and discrimination and injustice and everything that is stated in the mission statements of those nonprofits. Why? Because there was nothing insurgency or subversivity about it. 
It was just another job. It was a career. That's colonized mindsets right there for you. So I'm part of a nonprofit. I got to disclose that. But at the same time, I, the nonprofit status is a, is a way to deal with the government, not a way to develop what I do. OK, so the next thing is um, you know, igniting systems that you know, change at scale re requires uh, a revolutionary strategy and, and approach to it. Um, if what we do is not revolutionizing whatever sector you are in, if you are just following the same patterns as before, uh, you probably won't get to, to expand and to achieve a uh, uh, impact at scale. And I'll show you how we did that with poultry, how we are doing that with poultry, because we haven't yet fully succeeded on that. And then we have to you know, strategically establish ourselves in an adaptable, agile, and resilient way, and that's a matter of strategy and tactics so that we can evolve because the threats that we have to deal with are not static. This is a, the, the corporate systems in the world are a very fast learning organism. They are really good at learning what protesters are doing and what they, what's happening here. And you can see the, their evolution in terms of how they respond. Tear gas, yes or no. Rubber bullets, yes or no. Water, cannons, you know, all of those things came as a result of these systems learning about how we have tried to overcome their oppression and, 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 and exploitation and extraction. They have learned and they are much more sophisticated because they got a lot more resources than we have. So we have to be able to be agile and resilient and adaptable so that we can evolve, so that we can be good revolutionaries, so that we can build an insurgency, so that we ignite the subversive nature that is innate to all of us because none of us likes to be under the boot. And then finally, when we have done these things, then we can have an agriculture system that will regenerate. So most people like to talk about regenerative ag as in what we do on the farm. Well, the land is just, a, in the ecology, is a very small part of regenerative agriculture. So let's not get confused with that anymore. So we have to understand how does colonization and how does our mind end up where we are before we can actually start putting the antidotes and reversing that. So I'm going to walk you through this quickly. It's nothing complicated. I didn't read this in a book. This is just simple, logical frameworks that we all know. I'm just going to organize it for you. First thing we do is we discover things, right? So, OK, so for Columbus, discover America, blah, 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 it goes, right? Oh, so Rodell discovered regenerative, and he's the father of regenerative agriculture. You see the Rodell Institute promoting that? Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to diminish Rodell's intelligence that way? He did so many good things. Why would we turn him into a colonizer? Ugh just bugs the heck out of me. <laughs> and then we name the discovery regenerative, the new world. I mean, indigenous native people have been doing regenerative ag for as long as, you know, before anybody else was in this continent. It's not, a, it's, 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 regenerative is a native, it's an indigenous concept. You can be regenerative if you're indigenous to the earth. And to clarify that, it, when I say indigenous, Indigenous means from this earth. So if you're not from this earth, then you're not indigenous. That's the only classification there is. Now, you may be native to North America or to Guatemala or to South America. You may be native. And it happens that native communities that have a sense of place and time and are connected to that grounding sense also happen to think from an indigenous perspective. And yes, it is true that out of the 370 million uh, 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 native communities in the world who occupy about 20% of the total land on Earth right now, they are the ones who have kept the indigenous regenerative way of thinking alive. The rest of us, we want to destroy it. We have gone colonized, and we have been bombarding them pushing them to the edge, discarding, invalidating them, calling them backwards and bush people and all kinds of things in an attempt to impose our will, our linear way of thinking, our extractive nature, our 
give me seed and give me lettuce and give me a space where it's in the city on the land and I will extract some energy out of it so I can have some food so I can be better off. That's how we did that. And today, if we're going to change this, we have to re-indigenize. We have to, we have to, well, let me walk you through this because I get too excited about these things. Um, we then create laws to legalize and appropriate what we have discovered that we have named. Just for a second, think about this country. You will see how that plays out. After that, we standardize and scale repression, ownership, and control of the systems that we created ourselves. So whether it's you know, the creation of the Supreme Court and all the courts and all the district courts and all of that, we standardize and scale that repression so that we can establish the process by which only certain groups can own and control land and everything around it, including people, if you look past just a few, not even a couple hundred years. Now we build systems to replace anybody who may think that this is not OK. Indigenous thinking is repressed because the system from the beginning understood that the culture, the way of seeing the world from the indigenous perspective was the biggest threat to the colonization process. They knew militarily they couldn't win, but they knew they could resist and become a resilient insurgency and eventually could explode into an into a intellectual revolution if they allow those communities to continue to live happily and in more harmony with their land, even though the native communities were also colonizing. You know, the natives here were colonizing. Christopher Columbus didn't start that in this country. That's, uh, I know, is a probably a controversial thing to say, but that is the truth. The Mayans, the Aztecs were colonizing the Mayans. They were maiming and killing and taking slaves. And the Mayans, you know, among themselves, the Quiches and the Cachiquels were at war. That's why uh, Pedro de Alvarado was able to take the Cachiquels, line them up, and defeat the Quiches, and, 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 and defeated the Cunuman up in the Campos de Urbina in Quetzaltenango in Guatemala. All of this is part of a colonized process. We are born with it, no matter which continent you came from. What's the difference then? The native indigenous thinkers had a detox process. That connection to nature that grounds us continuously and is a daily practice. If you don't do that, you will fall off the cliff and you will become one of those who are now responsible for taking our world and, and, and are about to send us to hell in a handbasket. That's how we do this last part. And that is the ultimate place. And then that place is when you are intellectually colonized and you are no longer even able to know that this room was structured to be a colonized system. Now, how do we do go around undoing some of that? So just flip every single one of those items. The first thing we have to do is reclaim and rediscover our Aboriginal way of thinking, our indigenous way of thinking, and re-indigenize ourselves. To start seeing the world from that energy perspective, to start seeing the lettuce not as a product of the soil, but as a form of energy to start to see ourselves as part of that cycle where we may have been a lettuce just a while ago. And now we are cells that are actually allowing me to speak to you. I mean, the eggs this morning are probably already in the process through my bloodstream. Just think about that. It's very fast. It's almost instantaneous because we are breathing air right now, which oxygen is going to go into our blood, is going to go aerated, and is already part of our organism within seconds after we take in a breath. That's how massive this re-indigenization of the way we think of the world can be and revolutionary. It is really revolutionary. Then we need to claim and secure, name those those systems so that we can express what I'm saying in the form of a brand in the market if you want. Because we still live in this world where we have to translate all of this stuff into something that everybody else would understand until they themselves can see it from the same perspective, until everybody can see the world for what it is rather than what we want and force it to be or want to force it to be. Until then, we're going to have to name whatever we're doing, so that everybody understands it, of course. We got to rebuild the community governing and protection systems. And it's happening all over. The Choaranju community in eastern Guatemala 
went back 450 years to find a little paragraph in the king whatever who, who wrote this uh, edict that allowed them to claim back their land 450 years later as a Cachiquel community in Guatemala. The, the British Columbia native communities all along all the way up to, to Alaska just uh, in the last 20 years have been able to restore their ancient government systems and now they have the hereditary chiefs and they have the government of Canada's imposed chiefs. They are both natives. One is indigenous, the other one is a colonizer. And it's the same in the US. The federal government imposes, and I have said this to the consuls themselves, so this is not something I'm just talking out loud about. The, the, the consuls and all of the native communities are imposed as part of the federal government structure to, in, to go and continue that colonization process that they couldn't do it just outright again, so now they do it subvertly. So we have to rebuild that. And people are doing a really good job. There are whole communities in Latin America now that no longer respond to the central governments. In Guatemala, there is like almost all the highlands. But just luckily for us, the Guatemalan government has not much capacity to govern. So the, a lot of those communities just brought back the original systems. One of those communities, San Jorge La Laguna, for the last 10 years has had almost no crime. And it's the first one that eliminated all plastics, 100% of them. San Jorge La Laguna is one of the 12 apostle towns around Lake Atitlan in Solola. Then we have to standardize those processes by which we reclaim more and more and more of this so we can actually end up with a revolution. And to do that, we need to act as insurgents with commitment that nobody, that no, no matter what happens to you, whether you end up in the streets and all of that, because you were doing this work and you can't earn money, like in my case, uh, we go around, you know, I'm, I know I'm not going to be a rich person. I don't care how much money I could make in farming. Money isn't the issue here. I could, I was born, you know, between poverty and misery. Well, maybe between misery and nothing. I don't know exactly where I was in, in, when I was a child. I don't remember ever being poor until the UN classified us as poor people. I didn't, didn't realize we were poor. We were growing everything we needed to eat. Yeah, we didn't have shoes. And yeah, sometimes you get thorns and you trip on that rock and you gush your foot and whatever. It always healed. And then we need to build systems. And for doing this, we need to, this is where we, where we actually build that new governing infrastructure. We can do that. The government, the federal government can have a lot of that upper level, you know, stuff that they need to do, protect the country and the, Homeland Security, all those things that are, sound good, even though they don't do any of it. Um, um, I mean, honestly, they, you know, the, the only reason we're still here is because nobody hates us bad enough for that. They, they want to really obliterate us, otherwise we'll be in around here. There's no way to protect ourselves against the very weapons we, we created ourselves anyway. You know, it's just that the very people who control those things are not interested in disappearing themselves. Is the whole mad thing? So we need to create those systems so that we can govern. This is something we govern. Your farm, nobody governs how you see nature. Nobody governs the fact that you can see nature as a flow of energy and that you can see the farm that way. You are the only one who can govern that. And you have allowed yourself to be contaminated and to be infected by this virus called colonization, which ends up in a mental illness. According to the National Psychiatric Association, greed is now a mental illness, technically. So how do we take then this you know, way of thinking and put it into practice? Well, I got to talk to you about chickens, because that's what I do. <clears throat> but it doesn't mean this couldn't have been pork or cow or cows or something else. The reason. I went with chickens is because in order to, to create a revolution, you need people. And in order to create it in the agricultural sector, you have to go indigenous and regenerative. And to be able to do that, you need some form of livestock because that is the foundation of the inoculation of the opti and the optimization of the biology of the soil, which is the place where energy gets transformed. So that we had to pick a livestock. Now, which livestock out there can have the largest ripple effect and has the, the smallest barriers of entry and the smaller 
um, uh, for both economical and also for people in terms of knowledge and capacity and all of that. Chickens. There's no way you can beat the chicken at that, right? That's why we picked chickens. It was nothing about making money or any of that. It was about building a revolution. Now, it just happens that we looked at the whole industry and thought, okay, if we were to decolonize a whole industry that size, we would need to build something that met very specific criteria that would make it insurgent, it would make it you know, revolutionary, it would make it all of those things, right? So the indigenous perspective gives us the blueprint for that. Why? Because I don't see the chicken as something I'm going to put out in a pasture or I'm going to do anything with the chicken. What I will do is learn first. Where did it come from? What does it like? I got to see the world completely from the chicken perspective before the chicken will become an energy transformation um, element in the farm. If not, it will become something I have to manage. And once I go that direction, it costs me more, more labor, more everything. So chicken is a jungle fall. It's a jungle fall, likes the trees, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I won't go into that because this is not a poultry training session. But just so you see where, where we're coming from. OK, so how does it make it a nature-based uh, and subversive? The um, rediscovery of where the chicken came from was the first step in that process. The, this, the breeds, you know, this, the Southeast uh, Asian jungles, studying what those jungles were like and all of that, and then, and then projecting that forward into any place in the world where we want to put chickens and seeing what would a jungle-like environment look like in that space. And so from that, we created, we started in Minnesota. We put elderberries and hazelnuts on the understory. On the ground level, we do sprouting systems. We do forages. The chicken, um, we observe them continuously until we found out what they go for, what they like best. And then we took samples. We took them to the lab. And we learned very quickly they go for the high protein, low fiber forages. And they skip the, the grasses. There is no such thing as a, as a pasture chicken. That's an oxymoron. That's a colonized mind at work, because that's what we want to see. And that's what we think. But nobody ever asked the chicken. Yeah, but the grass, they trample it. That's the consistency that we have observed. And when they eat it, and when they eat the grasses, uh, from a physiological perspective, we know that they spend more energy digesting the grass than they get out of it anyway. So it's kind of productive. So I don't want grasses in there anyway. Tree range. OK, so here's a simple agronomical blueprint for how to do regenerative indigenous-based poultry. Put some energy into it, because we are doing more than what the, just the space will support. Of course, it's got to be economically viable. Now we go to balance out, colonize with indigenous so that we can actually survive in the market. Right? We've got to reconcile that. Remember when I said the beauty of native communities, indigenous thinkers, is that they have a detox to the colonized urge. It's not that we are not going to be colonized to a very degree. We got left and right brain after all. It's not like they're going to just disappear. We got male and female hormones, all of us. And they are at war all the time trying to dominate each other, colonize each other. right? So it's not like we can get rid of that, but we can balance it. And if we balance it, we can be in harmony. A little bit of bad is not, is not that bad if you, most of what you do is balanced. Remember, even the native um, tradition, so the, the shamans will, would feed the, the underworld because it was important to have them at balance with the above world so that, so that they don't fight each other, so that they are as happy as they can be in harmony because we are in the middle. And guess who gets knocked out when they are in trouble? Is us, right? So it was always about keeping that. That's what I'm talking about. So we will, you know, because we're not gonna just raise a few chickens. Remember, $43 billion uh, industry. That's what we wanna change. So we're not gonna go doing 50 chickens, 100 chickens, 200 chickens, 500 chickens. No, no, we're gonna go to scale. But how are we gonna do that and still balance the colonized versus, the, you know, decolonized indigenous framework? Well, this is one way. This energy comes in in the form of grain, in the form of some feed, uh, sprouted grain, forages, all of that. Some of that energy that comes into the free-ranging system under the trees came from the air. 
Some of that energy comes because we have trees and they will capture uh, carbon and they will put it into leaves. Those leaves then will drop to the ground and when they drop to the ground, we'll put grain in there and that grain is gonna absorb some of that energy. That energy is gonna become forage and that forage is eaten by the chicken. Is CO2 free? Nobody has to purchase that. But you have to be patient and you have to understand how it works. Otherwise, you're gonna cut all the trees, put the chickens out and feed them. And once you do that, you end up with 60 to 70% of your cost is gonna be feed. And that's the way to shoot you in the, yourself in the foot. So this energy is critical, it's free. It's coming out of the CO2 in the air, the ammonia, the, the photons and all of that, and the microbes in the soil. Inside the paddock, we generate the first energy harvest, which comes in the form of meat and eggs and hazelnuts and elderberries and timber and oak, uh, um, 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 nuts and um, also energy harvest that is going to be taken up by, by, the, by the weeds in the forages and also the sprouts and all of that. Plus, some of that energy is going to be deposited in the ground because the chickens are going to turn some of it and turn it into poop. Most of it, up to, about, up, upwards of 60%, is going to be deposited at night in the coop, which then allows us to take that energy and move it, all of that non-edible energy. Remember, we are talking about 60 to 70% of the energy being harvestable and edible, marketable for cash or for a food security or for whatever. And the rest of it is just energy, but it's very valuable energy, but you can't eat it quite yet. You gotta wait a little bit longer for it to be transformed into something you can eat. Some of it, it's gonna come in the form of manure, giblets, feathers, and those things. Remember, all of this is still the same molecules that came in in the form of feed and CO2 and H4, NH4 and all of that. So don't let it go. That is money flowing through your system too. Remember, money and energy are the same in a farm operation. Whether it's diesel or the tractor or your labor or somebody else's labor or whatever, it's still energy and you are managing energy. And if that energy is poorly invested, it returns, it also results in poor returns of energy. And they are parallel to money. And this way, you actually are putting in, um, putting in a small portion and then turning that into thousands of units of energy because nature has an incredible capacity to, to transform that energy. Back in 1987, I wrote a formula that now I use for this. If you, if you can visualize this, it goes energy on one side, plus new energy, which is photons, CO2, and all of that, comes into a space where you multiply that times a TR, transformation rate. That's mostly the biology in the soil. That's where that energy is going to be turned into thousands of new units of energy, and so on and so forth minus lost energy, which is, you know, if microbes in the soil will perspire CO2 as well to the equivalent of 25 grown adults per acre. So they still put CO2 out in the air, so we will lose some of that energy. And that equals two kinds of energy, edible energy and non-edible energy. Edible energy, we harvest it, and we put it into our plates or into the truck or into the processing facility or whatever, the non-edible energy goes back and becomes part of the energy bank for the next cycle, and that's it. It's pretty cool. Okay, so that formula is what is here, except now it's expressed in actual agronomical practices, actual outputs, and actual processes. Outside of the area where we raise the chickens, we have an extended area where we move all of that energy because we don't want to keep that in the paddocks where the chickens are because there is plenty of energy there already. It doesn't need more. And in that space outside, we can manage in excess of 20 times the space that we are managing here. So for every one and a half acre units of poultry production that we utilize, that we manage, we can manage up to 20 to 29 acres of non poultry production where we brought the excess energy into so that we can harvest a new form of energy in the form of vegetables, perennial vegetables, grains, and all of that. Some of that goes right back into the system and the cycle starts again. And this requires no other inputs than just this. And it regenerates. And now on the 10th year, 
we don't know what to do with all the energy because we are, I mean, our hazelnuts are producing at three and four times the rates that they are producing in other farms that don't have a closed uh, system like this. And now I'm not talking about just a farm. This could be, <coughs> this could be a thousand farms. Some of them doing poultry, some of them doing this, you know, and this done in a um, light industrial park, not in the farm, and then many farms doing this. This, this doesn't, it's not locked into a specific space where you are myopically just thinking that you're gonna make it and so that will be again a colonized way of thinking about this. Expand, let your mind flow and think systems, not projects. Don't think about the farm, think about say the eastern seaboard. This manure, I actually have the slides on how this, the manure the giblets and the feathers, those, we separate them because they, they got so, so different nutritional compositions that we don't want to. Okay, let's put it this way. They can be, they don't have to be. So if you have, say, 400 acres, you could do this, or not even 400, like 40 acres. You could do this full loop. Never sell manure, never sell, except, you know, eggs and meat and hazelnuts and elderberries. You don't have to sell anything else, maybe if I would. Uh, so then it doesn't become a market product. Now, if you are, say, a new immigrant farmer, and this is also uh, critical because the design, the engineering, and the architecture is all designed so that almost anybody can access this system, but also, you know, no matter how beginning you are, but also if you are an established farmer with 400 acres, you can also use it. The key is to design for this end because this end makes it accessible to everybody. While we, when we engineer for this group, everybody else gets excluded. That's why we started from this side, right? That's another way of social indigenousness, right? So bottom line is that if you are like me, few acres, I'm not gonna have enough room for all of the manure that I'm gonna produce and all of that. Now, I don't want that manure becoming a waste product that then pollutes and so on and so forth. So before my farm gets set up, I find somebody who can buy this manure from me I'll put it in a form that is, it is acceptable, we'll bring it to their place, and I can earn some money for it. Um, or they can give me grain for my chickens instead. And now I just knocked out that whole part of my cost by having manure production. At the end, the key is to exchange energy and to value that energy. We can use the dollar, we can use cryptocurrency, we can use local money. You can use as, uh, a, a journal. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter. That's up to people to govern how you do that, as long as you decolonize the process first so you don't end up screwing up everything else all over again. No. No, I don't have to. He's, he's, he's doing a good job on his own world, and, and that's good. Um, so this is what it looks like when you engineer this way. A lot of forages, hazelnuts. Above the hazelnuts, other trees, like in our case in Minnesota, um, walnuts, uh, oaks, sugar maple, basswood, uh, think, Google big woods, look at the species, that's what we'll put there because I'm in the middle of the big woods. In San Miguel de Allende in Mexico is olive trees, uh, mulberries, oaks, and other species. In northern Guatemala is ramon, avocados, bananas, oranges, and 10 other forest species. The same in Belize. In and up in the highlands, it's cherries, it's oaks, it's pines, it's other things. You get the idea, right? That's how we design from an indigenous perspective and manage energy instead of producing eggs and chickens. Uh, in the winter, because the same reason we wouldn't do chicken tractors, we go to sleep and we wait till the spring and then we start all over again. So there is no point in fighting nature. On the laying hands, good point. On the laying hands, like, it's a whole nother story. What we did was, just quickly, we, we built an insulated building with an extended solarium, we call it. It's just a greenhouse. That greenhouse is calculated so that the chickens can get at least five square feet in the winter per chicken. In that solarium, we put a very large 10-inch pipe on the top, and then we, shoot, we, we connected that to underground perforated six-inch piping up to 500 foot long under a regular uh, 1,500 egg layer unit. And then in the fall, before it gets cold, we start shooting the hot air, which can reach up to 120, 130 degrees up on the top of the greenhouse. And on a 30 degree below, 
out, uh, outside temperature uh, with sun, this temperature up there gets to 100 to uh, 90 to 100 degrees. So instead of venting that heat out, we vent it into the ground. And in three feet underground, we put that tile. And then on top of that, we put two feet of uh, three inch rock. On top of that rock, we put a, wire, a mesh. On top of that mesh, we put a foot of soil. We, we, we shoot that air that heats up that massive amount of biomass, and it can stay warm for up to three weeks, even with cloudy skies and 30 below outside. No, it was somebody else. I mean, I was just, just not interested in being cold. That was all. <laughs> that was my only motivation. And I didn't want to be spending money to warm up a building. And the chickens can actually generate that. But if you want to check the, the original blueprint, I, of course, I didn't do the exact thing because I modified and did all kinds of other things to it. If you understand thermodynamics, it's pretty easy to do this. Uh, just, just think indigenous and think energy management. Don't think of other. If you let yourself get, be dragged by, by ideas out there, I mean, you go. You, you, you will take any of those ideas because all of them make sense. In Guatemala, we have a saying, if you don't know where you're going, every bus takes you there. <laughs> we also reached an agreement with the predators, all of them. And the way we did is we went uh, to the space where, and we pretended to be the predator. And we started to look at the world that way. For the hawk, we used a drone. So I could see what the hawk sees. And then if I'm a hawk, um, OK, so it, this is different in Guatemala, by the way, because we have those hovering hawks. And then you sit there. They don't need to zoop and take off like the hawks here <laughs> and the eagles. So that presented another challenge, because the system in Minnesota wouldn't work for those hawks. So that was a different strategy. So in that case, we looked at our products from the perspective of the hovering hawk. In the case of Minnesota, we look at the paddock from the perspective of the zooping hawk. So just like a plane, uh, it needs a little landing pad, and it needs an open space, and it needs uninstructed space so that they can take off again and fly away. And when you think of all of that, then you can design the paddock and the canopies and all of that to, one, hide the chickens. That's the first thing. Hide away, man. I mean, run away and hide. This is like the original principle of every species. So that's the first thing, right? And chickens do that on their own. You don't have to train them. Um, <laughs> the second, but we needed to build in that canopy. Second thing is that they only, they, they know at which level of canopy the hawk can get through, and then they get nervous. So we put a cameras on the ground and the, and, the, and the drone, and then I built a canopy, artificial canopy with corn and sunflowers, and I tested both of them separate. And then, so we built a 100% canopy, no problem, no problem. I mean, hog can't get in, chicken is not afraid. And then we started thinning it, thinning it, thinning it. When we got to 60% canopy, the chickens got really scared. And that's when they said, check. And then we moved on to the next predator until we got all of them, and we haven't yet lost chickens to predators. We'd lost them at the beginning. Somebody had to sacrifice to learn, you know, but that's another story. Full-grown flock on, on graduation day. This is cherries. Uh, they survived. I don't know why. This is another cherry. Those are the hazelnuts that are still coming up with little cages so that they won't obliterate them. Because <laughs> you see they eat everything. But these are graduating, and they have been here for a while. And they still, they still cover, a little bit of cover. As soon as they leave, this is going to get covered with straw and seeded again. And it becomes this beautiful carpet. Oh, uh, anything. I mean, right now, the neighbor had uh, extra wheat. So that's what we're using. Uh, if, sometimes we get camelina. Sometimes we get amaranth. Sometimes we can mix all those seeds. Um, the thing we don't use is um, soybeans. Now, did you know that hazelnuts, in terms of biomass, can produce you the same biomass as soybeans per acre? <clears throat> and not only that, but one of the key ingredients, um, amino acids of chickens, is methionine. Methionine is authorized and is, is used in organic feeds because uh, artificially manufactured, um, synthesized because it's not present in nature, in the nature of the conventional chickens in large scale enough to, to meet the methionine requirements of chickens. 
Now, methionine, crickets and worms and all of those critters that chickens love are rich in methionine. The, the problem is that these chickens will obliterate any moving thing within five minutes after they get out. So it's not like we can feed them bugs. That's, an, that's a, just a, a laughable thing when people say, I'm raising a thousand chickens and I'm feeding them bugs. And it's like, sure, man, <laughs> you betcha. Uh, <clears throat> so, but hazelnuts can produce oil, just like soybeans. Can, you can have meal left over, just like soybeans, which in fact, in the feed, we don't use soybeans whole. We use soybean meal, which is what is left after the soybeans oil is extracted, which is high in omega-6, while hazelnuts are high in omega-3, high in methionine, and um, the uh, structure of the hazelnut oil is almost equivalent to olive oil to the point that olive oil is now being substituted with hazelnut oil. The value of that is about 20 times the value of anything you can get out of soybeans and requires no tilling. And if you have chicken, no weeding and no fertilizing. And it can last 30 to 35 years, then you coppice it and you start all over again. You can, your generation will never have to replant. That's how beautiful it is. That is, I would say, if you are managing energy instead of producing something. Um, from seed to this size, which is now producing, four years to five years. From the time we transplant them here to the time they produce, three years. Because we let them grow to a year and a half in the nursery, and then we bring them out. It's too bad we won't have time, otherwise I could show you all of that, because I got pictures, yes. But hold on a second. Yes, to do that, uh, we build systems rather than you know, farm processor stuff. So right now we are partnering with a processor in the southeastern Minnesota. We're now the anchor client for that processor, custom processing, and they are now thriving because we have a poultry system that can scale and can give them enough throughput so they can make money. Otherwise, they'll be just sitting there waiting for 100 farmers bringing 50 chickens each, which breaks their backs and nobody wins anything. The hazelnuts were not yet because we don't, we don't have enough volume. But we have two partners now that have the dehusking, the sorting, and the cracking machines, and the oil extraction to the extent that we have been extracting oil out of the limited couple thousand pounds that we get. Um, and for the last five years, I have not bought oil. But that's still, you know, just home. Right now, we do it by hand, but a modified blueberry picker is already in operation at the Arbor Day Foundation in Nebraska, and also at a little farm. It's called, uh, well, in Lake City, Minnesota. It's owned by Norm Erickson, <coughs> if you want to take a look at the machine harvesting equipment. Um, the key is that the, even though there is fences around this place, the, the machine is very small, so we build the gate so that you can actually put the machine through, and if you so want to, you can go and harvest this with the machine. I rather not because this is the place where I detox. So I want to harvest them by hand. That's a spiritual thing. Just about the size of that one. In fact, I probably already removed those, but yay hi. Um, OK. Regenerative ag is a four-dimensional affair. Again, if you are not looking at the land, if you're not looking at the process in a linear way, you won't look at the land in a flat way. A, a, an acre to us is not 46,350 square feet. It's between 1.6 and 2.5 million cubic feet because we manage energy, right? And it starts 12 feet underneath in the case of the hazelnut root system, and it ends at about 12, but then comes the oaks and all of that. So it's probably 24 to 36, up to 60 in the rainforest, 80 and 100 feet above ground. That is our management area. That's where we stored energy to be transformed from non-edible, disorganized, and tropic energy to highly organized, edible, harvestable. That's central to economic management. If you can't manage all of that resource, you are leaving a lot of resources on the table that could be turned into something very valuable. Even if you harvest the tree and you drop it or whatever, and you don't want to mess with harvesting it, I mean, turning it into firewood or something else, even if you just live in the ground, it's still energy that is going to be harvested. It can be harvested again. So economics and three-dimensional, all of that is all together. Ecologically, I mean, tell me what can we get wrong ecologically if you follow this model, this process, the logic framework that I just described. 
where we started the native species, the native vegetation from the ground all the way to the top. We're putting the poultry back in its natural environment. I mean, you would have to tell me what's wrong with that because I can only tell you what's right. Socially, guess what? When you do this thing, you have to connect to other people because somebody knows something you don't know and you gotta talk to them so they can help you out. Somebody's got grain that you need. Somebody's got poultry manure that you need for your grain. Somebody have firewood for your wood stove. Somebody always has something. In the case of the hazelnut, when the hazelnut is cracked, you got a shell. That shell has the density of Brazilian cherry, 3,000 square inches, I mean, pounds of pressure per square inch. The density of that produces you some of the most beautiful blue flame, flames that will hit your house if that's what you want to use it for. Don't put corn in that stove. Okay, so just because I get so excited and then I can't keep going. Um, but if you have those things, if you have all of that, then you have the foundation for detoxifying your mind, your body, and your spirit. And if you can do that, you have the fourth dimension. No farmer that sits in the tractor or no farmer who is organic and sits on machines and plants in rows is going to develop a spiritual connection to that beautiful energy space. The energy only flows if you allow it to flow. And when you put it in rows, you are imprisoning that energy, and it won't flow to you. And as a result of that, you will be poor spiritually. And spiritual poverty is the thing that is killing us. That's why people shoot each other. That's why people are depressed. That's why people are, all of these things we talk about comes from spiritual poverty, at least the origin. And then there's other things. Because with spiritual poverty, if you get depressed, then you don't work as much. And if you don't work as much, you don't earn as much. And it's just this thing just has no end to it. You go into this spiraling. And once you're spiraling, it's like falling from a plane and spiraling, and you can have the parachute and everything, but you're never going to be able to think about it. And you're going to crash with the parachute on you. That's what happens to us when we go spiritually poor. That's why we have to fix this. That's why we have to decolonize, and that's why we have to build a freaking revolution. Otherwise, we are doomed, people. <laughs> if we do this, yes, we can have regenerative agriculture but only if we do this. Otherwise, it's just more hot air, and it's more whitewashing, and it's more buzzwords, and all of that. And yes, a lot of people are gonna make a lot of money out of it, because consumers don't know what they want anyway. Name and reclaim. Well, this is our little contribution to naming and reclaiming our indigenous way of thinking. And I hope we go global. If you're a farmer, please join us. If you're a grocery store, please put us product in the market. If you're a restaurant, please do that, like Birchwood in the Twin Cities. Check out Tree Range. You see, we have this big event. We're bringing lots of people together to talk Tree Range now. So rebuilding, governing, and protection. This is Canadian communities coming together with the government. Um, in British Columbia, that was 2011. This is what the little story I told you about. Once you have this blueprint, now let's organize. We, what we went through is a, is a farm energy management blueprint. But we could do all of that right, and then a corporation comes over and buys you out. Now they have it all, and you're still a laborer, even regenerative and everything. Right? And that's what they are starting to do now, from General Mills all the way to Cargill. They're starting to do that, eyeballing that. Pillsbury, remember Pillsbury? With the first organic farm up in the north northwest, 90 acres was the biggest organic farm. As soon as it became profitable, Pillsbury grabbed that. That was like before I came to this country. I learned about that from newspapers. And that's when I learned you got to watch out for that. Because good stuff, when it works the way we design, it wants to be grabbed. So here's how we organize cooperatives, associations, and infrastructure. Start with the free range chicken and the eggs. Now, I'm not saying that it has to be about chickens. It's just that that's what I do. I'm trying to change the poultry system. But the American Grass-Fed Association is doing that with grass-fed. I don't know if they, you know, they thought it all the way through, but they are doing their best. The bison, the native communities are trying to do this with bison. It's just that bison has a very dedicated and very specific blueprint. I mean, you can't have regenerative grass-fed cattle in the rainforest. That's an oxymoron. Rainforest belongs in there, not cows. 
right? So there is a lot of that going on right now. Like I said, if you don't know where you're going, every bus takes you there. Now we add the meat poultry processing, but not a you know, backyard kind of thing. I'm talking about a processor that puts in all the equipment you could find. This is where the colonized process actually is useful to us because the, the, the value of this egg or this chicken, it's already defined. Once it leaves the farm, that chicken isn't going to get healthier anymore. <laughs> it's frozen. So what you do with it from that point forward, it needs to be quick, it needs to be inexpensive, but it needs to be done at scale so that we can have those economies of scale and all that so that we don't artificially increase the price for the final consumer who then is not going to be able to afford it and then we can scale. You see, that's another thing we have to be careful with. But we already nailed the most important part, which is how that energy was transformed into something that we can then move through what we call the supply chain. Grain processing, grain production, manure management, perennials, edible vegetables, remember the whole circle that I drew for you before, agroforestry, fish production, because you got guts and other things, and there's a lot of fish that actually are meat eaters, and that we tested it, it's beautiful. Because then, remember that if you put those guts and all of that into a compost pile, it's going to be nine months to a year before it's soil. If you take the, all your, your kitchen scraps and put it into a compost pile, it's going to be six months, nine months before it's soil. You give it to the chickens, 48 hours later, the hazelnuts are taking it up. You give the giblets to the fish, instead of putting it into a compost pile, 48 hours later, it's ammonia suspended in water, which then you can harvest and use as fertigation. And now you've got another kind of protein, two of the most important white lean proteins in the world. Right? So the key thing is don't get colonized and go put in fish tanks. Do it in nature. I made a mistake. I built a fully deployed, absolutely perfect aquaponic system with 14 tanks with fish and all of these greenhouses with vegetables. We did the whole thing. And it worked perfectly from a technical and engineering perspective. There was Nothing more to be desired, except energy-wise, total disaster. So we took it down and put hazelnuts, and now we rent chickens in there. Yes, but also, also because it's so artificial, if you blink, you lose it. If you blink, you lose it. If uh, pH goes up, you lose the fish. Uh, if uh, the, whatever the medium uh, fails, you lose the fish, or you lose the plants. If the temperature dropped by four degrees below seven degrees, you start losing the plants. It's artificial. It's artificial. And I don't do artificial. And I didn't, I forgot about it. And so that's why it's important to be continuously detoxifying from the colonized gravity pole. Yes, but what I'm doing is going after um, native communities and asking them to use the natural habitats and then and the native species and by going back indigenous. I mean, that's what I was supposed to do from the beginning. But I fell. I mean, I fell into that trap, and I feel shame, shameful about it. But that's why I took the greenhouse down, and I didn't want anything else to do with it. The chickens were different, because the chickens at 45 degrees, they are happy as a wink. You know, it's like, no problem there. Yes, in fact, um, but grouse, remember, they are prairie animals. They are not forest. And so that presents an, a whole other blueprint. I went to the Omaha and the Ponca Nation in Nebraska because that is the land of the grouse and the prairie chicken, or their cousins. It, the stories say that the, the, the prairie chickens used to cover five mile longs, five mile long, one mile wide, and three layers thick to the point that they clouded the, the sun just as much as a heavy storm would. That's the story of the prairie chicken. And we want to get back into it, but those animals are very difficult um, to understand. And to, and, and, and to bring back into the natural environment. And I don't want to screw that up like I screwed up the whole aquaponic thing. So I've been, I've been working with them, and we are trying to be very deliberate about this. And they are watching the prairie uh, chickens, and a lot, some of those native folks know a lot about them. But even them can't find the nest, for example. They hide them in a way that is incredibly sophisticated. The chickens, I used to do that when I was seven years old. I would go find the nest, and that's how we never put nests in the coops or anything. Now the hens will disappear. My mom, oh, the fox or the dogs probably got them. 
Well, about a month later, they would come back with all the chicks. You know, they were just sitting out there somewhere. We never knew where they were. Pheasant, not exactly um, dwell into it. The one fact I had, and that's why I grew disinterested, is because I heard they were imported from China. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but that's, that kind of rang a bell. And I don't have time anyway. So um, I am, I'm stuck with the chicken until we change the system. And then we'll, you know, even the, the prairie chicken and the grouse, I mean, I'll, I'll see if we can help them if we have a processing facility in Nebraska, sure. But it's going to be the natives that have to do that. Because, I mean, I got so much work with the chicken anyway. So when you put this all together, what you have is a fully integrated flow of energy and enterprise systems that involves all the way from 14 to 20 enterprise sectors. And you can create the demand on a region to to, to, to justify having services like enterprise management, financial, land management, organizing, R&D, training, extension, uh, on the financing, this, we're talking about banks and, and other folks engaged in Minnesota and southeastern Minnesota, these pieces are already like 25% executed. So we are moving along um, steady. It has to be evolutionary. We have to adapt. We have to be able to respond to changes in the environment. So the rediscovery, redevelopment, redeployment, and growth and scaling, those are the four stages. Discovery, development, deployment, and growth. Those are the four phases of our cycles, no matter where we are and who we are doing this with. We first go, and if we're going to work with, say, the, 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 the prairie chicken, we'll go through a process of discovery, and we're doing that now. We did that with the chicken. If it's a community, we'll do ecological, social, and economic discovery so that we can learn the pieces that we're going to be working with, whether it's energy, whether it's species, whether it's communities, markets, capital, all of that. We'll put all of that on the table before we go to the second phase, which is the development of what? Development of the business plans and the performance and all of that, and development of the capacity of people to manage that. Those two things get developed in the second phase. Uh, the deployment, it happens after we have all of this in place, then we go ahead and deploy that's what we are in the process of in Minnesota now. Um, and also San Miguel de Allende in Guatemala and British Columbia and, and Nebraska and South uh, Dakota and Pine Ridge. And we're exploring in, uh, Cincinnati and Ohio uh, and, um, I mean, uh, Cincinnati and Dayton, um, um, Fairfield, Iowa. And I hope uh, you guys get excited enough and we start our process here. The growth scale repeats, um, you know, moves us back to the discovery, and then we just put this cycle through. It's called the per Permanent Improvement Management System. It was developed by Demon. If you look at the Demon cycle, all I did was take that, that system of management of perennial improvement and put it into the context of the evolutionary aspect that we need in order to create a poultry revolution, or a chicken revolution, like they say in Guatemala. This, we put it through a process, a staggered process that allows us to systemically and methodically deploy the system. The first thing we do is we, we build a production unit, a prototype, a concept where we can get people trained. Everybody who's going to be part of the system because we don't have an opportunity to go. We are like the, the hovering hawk, okay? We have to drop, grab, and go because that's the nature of the system we're in. It's a very aggressive, very... Uh, difficult uh, system to deal with. So strategically, we have to have a process that allows us to do that. And that means we go from proof of concept, we deploy a farm, and then we deploy a whole system. But we got to do that really fast so that we don't lose all of the money that we put up front uh, before we actually gain speed to take off and carry our chicken with us. Yeah, the question is about considering village level deployment. In fact, that's the only way we do it. And then you decide what your village is, but we are not going to work with a farmer. Um, that uh, puts, at a, uh, <clears throat> puts us at a very strong disadvantage, takes a lot of energy, and a farm isn't going to change peep, no matter how big you are. And then after we deploy those regions, uh, as we deploy those regions, and uh, even it, all of this kind of, this too happens almost simultaneously. You start this, and then a few months later, you start this, and then uh, you start this, and uh, you know, as you deploy this, you start organizing this, and as you organize this part, then the, the, the regional systems, then you start building the industry and community level infrastructure. And by this, we mean like industrial parks. The checkerboard that I showed you, 
we mirror the landscape deployment and then consolidate the processing value added in all of that aggregation, marketing, branding, and all of that. You have to consolidate that. And then you can bring uh, a region of 100 mile radios into one single space. But we now can create brands and competitive advantages and those kinds of things that are critical to actually succeed in this battle we're in. OK, this is a production unit. There's a fence here. You don't see it. It's a little post sticking up. Um, this is one paddock. This is the other paddock. This is seven years. This is my space. Uh, this is where some of the manure was going. And then now all of there's there's almost no grass to mow anymore. All of it had been turned into an energy transformation space. So this is what a production unit will look like once it's mature. This is elderberries. Um, in the middle, these are the hazelnuts. Uh, this is probably June, July. This is the blueprint of a farm. This is the first farm we deployed. These are all the species we identified. This is the whole discovery phase expressed in a drawing. Um, these are the production units on the south side of the farm. This, this uh, one here is was built with that design I told you about for uh, passive solar. So we will eventually put eggs in there. Right now we got broilers, but we is designed to be an egg production year round. Uh, the rest of them, there is, uh, this is 12 acres in total. There's a buffer here between the neighbor on the south and us. This buffer is 60 feet wide. In this space here, we, will, we are going to put gates. Right now, we access from here. The chickens, the chickens go from the barn into this paddock while this one regenerates, and then they go here while this one regenerates, and so on, and back and forth, and back and forth, till they graduate. Um, <clears throat> this um, <clears throat> south side here, we selected a 20-foot um, alley. We're putting gates. <clears throat> we will be putting gates on the south sides here on all of the paddocks. And then um, this allows us to do a 125 pig run. So when the hazelnuts start producing, we're just going to let them drop here. And then we'll, we'll train the pigs to open up the gates uh, so that they can go harvest that. And then we can grow um, Iberico pork in Minnesota. Um, so that way, we eliminate work. We reduce our cost. We increase our value added. Um, we produce another um, product out of the farm and also transform more energy, which is the key. Because in here, we probably want to keep harvesting by hand, and that takes work, and we are allergic to it. <coughs> now, if you are into, into the money, here's how it will the, 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 which look like. Broiler production, one production unit, okay? This is, this is one flock. This is not what you produce in a year. This is what you produce for every flock. Takes 63 days to 70 days, max, okay? Those chickens you saw in the video, uh, 63 days. That's our average. So we start with, we start, we start normally above 1,500. We end up with just around 1,500. The key is to keep them at one square foot per chicken of indoor space, 40 square foot of outdoor space, two square feet for the egg layers, 80 square feet of outdoor space for the egg layers. Now, the egg layer, we use up to 4,000 egg layers per flock per unit, divided into two flocks, into four paddocks, 7.5 acres. This is a 1.5 acre, divided into two production units, like I showed you in the picture. Again, it's not a poultry training session, so I'm not going to go further into that. But just so you know, we are averaging about 3.6% in mortality, as compared to 10 to 15% that most farmers uh, lose. Most of this mortality also happens within the first few days after the chickens arrive and before we have invested much into them. Normally, by the time the chickens start ranging, at day 28 or 30, four weeks later, uh, but from that point forward, we rarely lose chickens. Again, because we factored in predators and everything, including nutrition and all that, so that they grow strong and that they are not uh, abusive of each other, so they don't bleed, and if they don't bleed, they don't cannibalize each other, and all of those things are part of the management process. Now, if you lose a chicken, you know, after you start ranging, you're losing a lot of money for every chicken you lose. It costs you labor, because now you are going to be taking care of that flock for the whole rest of their time, and, you're, and that chicken is no longer going to be producing economic value. If that matters to you a lot, then you should think about how you manage that, that area there. We produce then 5,500 or so pounds at 3.75 pounds per bird, although this is the low point because we normally produce 3.9 and 4.25 pound birds. So you, this is way more than that on an average, but I wanted to give you the low, more conservative number. We are selling at 350 per pound right now, wholesale, already processed and everything. 
the gross income for flocks about 19,000. And again, not necessarily the farmer. Why? Because the farmer sells their chicken to the aggregator at farm gate value. The aggregator then takes all of the chickens from all of the farmers into a processor, and the aggregator uh, oversees that whole thing. The farmer goes back to grow more chickens. The aggregator goes on to make sure that that makes it all the way to the market, that it's marketed, branded, blah, 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 all of those things, right? So you have to keep that in mind. This is why out of the $19,359, this goes to the farmer, this goes to the processing, this is the total cost, and this is right now the operating margin that we are generating. This is not profit. This includes the labor for the farmer at $1.25 per chicken, health insurance, and retirement. Now, tell me, how many people calculate that into the cost of production? And we still have an operating margin. Of course, we're selling at a high price, but this is what we have to scale, because if we don't scale right now, our cost of production is the same as the cost of processing and delivery. It should be no more than 25% of the cost of production to process and deliver that chicken. But right now, the system is so inefficient because we don't have the proper size infrastructure to process and deliver those chickens. We're transporting chickens from the farm to the processor with uh, uh, 700 to 1,500 birds per load. We should be doing minimum 5,000 chickens per semi. We don't have that yet. Why? Because also the processor can't handle that either. So all of that has to be fixed. Once we fix that, then we'll bring down, we calculate that in the next two years, we can bring down the, 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 the other half of the cost, which is up to the farm gate, back to about half of what we have right now with minor investments in the regional uh, deployment. Once we do that, this price can go down and the farmer can still get the same income. All right, so let's in five minutes say, this is the full production units as we calculate per farm so that you can actually make a living off of this. Six acres, 23,000 bird finish, 88,500 pounds of production at a you know, gross income of 309,000. 258 per farm goes to the farmer, 51,000 goes to that operating space. It's a pretty simple economic profile. Now, we can't get lost with this, and we have perfected the data collection so that we don't make mistakes that are more than maybe 1% or 2% uh, standard deviation from this. That is critical. To launch an insurgency, you need fine-tuned equipment and machinery. can't fine-tune something that you don't become an expert and become good at and you focus with, focus on. Now, if you take this and stack it, remember that the six acres that produce all of that also produce about 4,000 pounds of hazelnuts at about three pounds per bush, which is half of what we actually documented right now. But that's what you know, uh, a lot of farmers are probably going to be comfortable with, and the universities don't want us claiming that we can do more than that, even though we are doing twice as much. Uh, that's 12,000 pounds. Right now, I can sell each one of those pounds for about $3 to $4, maybe $5 if I can package them on the farm and ship them directly online. If I can do that, I can get $5 for that. That's $60,000. That was completely a byproduct of the chicken of raising the poultry. Oh, and then we have all of the rest of the benefits here, which we haven't figured out how we can calculate in monetary value. If we can't do that, we'll think of this as a spiritual return on investment. Now, if you take that and now develop that checkerboard and you deploy a regional pool, only poultry alone, we're not, you know, remember that pool is going to do eggs, it's going to do value added, uh, it's going to do eggs and chicken, it's going to do value added hazelnuts and elderberries, extracts and medicines and all of that. That's part of that industrial light industrial deployment. But if we just look at chickens at 85 production units, I um, mean 85 farmers with four PUs each. We need only 510 acres to produce 7.5 million pounds of chicken at 2 million broilers. At 2 million broilers, we can at least achieve a minimum level of efficiency on the processing. It's still way too microscopic, but it's, but it's good enough that we can probably you know, drop that cost uh, above being on the farm by at least you know 50% of what we're spending right now unnecessarily. But that gives us a total market share of $26 million. Farmers can bring home 13, processing can keep six, and the regional enterprise uh, system to manage it and deploy it for the folks who are going to do branding, marketing, accounting, business management, extension services, veterinary services, medicinal, all of those things, all the herbalists in the system, the chemists, the soil scientists, all of them can get paid out of this year. 
and now we actually have a regional system. Now it's still a system, but at least a regional system, and we know how to deploy it. And then, of course, you've got to add to this all of the other value, which right now we just, we just haven't yet gotten enough data, but I'm hoping in a couple of weeks we do. Now, you pick that regional producer pool for eggs. We calculated that 65 million eggs, we can deploy a plasma facility about twice the size of this room. So very tiny, but um, enough to be able to deploy at least 32 farms of two production units for 477 acres, and can generate $16 million out of that. And the eggs, because the processing is so simple and so not really expensive but compared to chickens, we can put most of the money back on the farm, <coughs> Keep eight eight hundred twelve thousand on the processing side, and then the regional enterprise system for branding and all that at five hundred forty one. If you are thinking of an enterprise, and you make this the divisions of your enterprise, this is one of those divisions that contribute this much money to the team that is going to be doing all of that. The other one contributes more. And if we do that, then we take the poultry that I'm talking to you about. We, we, we match it with the folks doing bison, other folks that are doing pork, grass-fed beef, perennial systems, all the folks that are doing you know, vegetables and, and fish and rice, and then we have a regenerative system. Regenerative system has very little to do with how you grow things. That is a very myopic, very colonized way of just trying to capture something and trying to squeeze all, uh, you know, a, a money out of it on the basis that consumers don't know what they want. And they can be fooled. Now, if you want to, the whole system, this is the blueprint of the whole revolution. We are just here right now. We still got a long ways to go, but we are moving steady at this point. So thank you, and I hope you decolonize a little bit. Thank you.